Welcome to week 5. We're going to look at what is the largest built environment in Southeast Asia in this lecture today. Um, so you probably know what Angkor Wat is. Uh, for those of you who are not sure, it's a temple monument located in Cambodia and it is today known as a world famous heritage. So what's so unique about this? When we look at the temple morphology like Angkor, which you see on the lower right corner your screen, we can see its resemblance to the Prambanan Hindu temple in central Java. Uh, perhaps this then suggests an inter-regional transfer of knowledge happening as the late Khmer Empire in seeking to express its imperial ambition on an architectural level sought out monumental precedent in this Prambanan. Uh, if you look at the dates and uh, when these were erected, these suggest some kind of transfer of knowledge from Java all the way to Cambodia. Alongside that, it was also part of a larger cosmopolis where you have miniature models of Mahabodhi, a 6th century Buddhist temple built in Bogaya during the Gupta Empire in India, also offering as a kind of template on different levels. Right? So the Bodhgaya was a site connected to Buddha's enlightenment. Over time, it had become a very important site of pilgrimage, still is, and like contemporary sites of pilgrimage today, there was a very lively tourism industry associated with it. Like, people like to carry things back to remind them of their time in, uh, in, uh, in the place that they visited. So miniature models of what Gaia's uh, iconic 6th century Buddhist uh, temple called the Mahabodhi often were carved in stones and once were either gifted or sold to pilgrims coming from all over the world. The tower came to symbolize the sacred mountain uh, that stood at the center of the Hindu Buddhist cosmology. And this is the Mount Meru and would feature over and over again in different reinterpretation of the sacred mountain landscape and would be part of the iconology of uh, Southeast Asia's understanding of what is considered sacred cosmology or sacred landscape in our part of the world as well. But um, these kind of landscapes are in many ways portable in more than one ways. In addition of to being something that can be scaled down to a, a, a size uh, like this miniature model you see here so that it can serve the purpose for commemoration uh, or as a memento it was also a landscape itself that can be replicated and reconstructed in situ, meaning on site, in elsewhere. So this is where we see how you can graph this landscape, take this landscape and graph the sacred mountain and its associated kind of like spatial registers onto a different site in a different place. And we see how this was grafted onto an Austronesian belief system in Ancestral Mount already last week in the form of the Pundan, in which case we can read the Buddha as quite different, as quite as an intersection of both Austronesian and Sastric spatial knowledge. Uh, over time, we see this expanded and evolved in Java into a temple form made up of graduated series of compounds framed by the passage of brick gateways that resembles in many ways what we discussed about in weeks three's lecture on the ceremonial aspects of the Malay house, palace, right? And so within the Malay palace, there is this graduated series of space. And we see this being played out theatrically uh, in the late classical East Javanese manifestation of how temple compounds were built rather than in that strictly concentric mandala model that we see in Borobudur or in Prambana. Similarly, uh, these framing devices were also found uh, uh, inflected differently in the Dravidian temple architecture of South India. So in parts of Tamil Nadu, uh, you'll find that uh, uh, temple architecture there were often framed using the Kapura, uh, rather late sort of invention, but erecting the Gopura at the entrance of the temple uh, seemed to have developed sometime in the mid-12th century uh, with the decline of the Chola, uh, 
and uh, and the need to fortify uh, temples as, uh, and, and protect protect them on some level led to uh, the the erection of higher and higher sort of towers entrance towers and we see this manifested very patently in many of the Hindu temples that subscribe to what is called the agamic principles of temple building uh, even in Southeast Asia as brought over by subsequent waves of diaspora commu uh, Tamil communities into our part of the world. Okay. Uh, therefore, when we think of Angkor, we are seeing the longer, what, we, what we're seeing before is that it was part of a longer historical arc. Uh, and that was, that's one approach that we can situate the temple within a larger space of interaction that stretches across, across the Indian Ocean. And this uh, has been called by uh, uh, Sheldon Pollock as a Sanskrit cosmopolis. But how else are scholars trying to understand Angkor today? So for those of you who have had the chance to visit Angkor Wat, or those of you who perhaps might have explored it via Google Street View, or have looked at pictures of what Angkor Wat looks like, you would have a sense of how impressive this is, uh, Angkor Wat is as a piece of architecture. Now try to imagine what is the type of city that is needed to sustain or build such an impressive piece of architecture. Of course, it doesn't take a village. It really takes an entire city. And the scale, the morphology, and the meaning uh, that structures life in such a city is something that historians and archaeologists are gradually only beginning to find out recently, and actually also using quite innovative methods uh, other than uh, consulting historical records, either by looking at Chinese travelers' accounts or epigraphic records, meaning those uh, statements uh, that were carved in stones and that have survived the test of time. Therefore, when we speak of Angkor, what the term really means in the Khmer, Khmer language, which is the language spoken by the Khmer people who makes up the majority of the Cambodian population today, the term Angkor really means city. Therefore, Angkor is more specifically a translation of what we've explored before in Sanskrit, that is the Nagara, the city-state. What has survived is a monument surrounded by large, dense forestation. So you can see here, if Angkor sits in the center here, even its surrounding area uh, is filled with, you know, jungle, thick, dense jungle, uh, before you see a, a very square-looking moat, which suggests that it's something that is made by man. Uh, but outside of that is then, again, uh, dense forested jungle. In recent years, however, archaeologists have figured out a way to peel underneath the layers of dense vegetal foliage to find out what are the clues that might tell us a bit about Angkor as a city. And more than that, at its peak, Angkor sustained a population of more than one million people. Therefore, it was a huge, low-lying uh, low city uh, that had a lot of people. What was the nature of the city? What sustained life in the city? To do so, archaeologists have turned to what is called LIDA. The term LIDA stands for light detection and raging, uh, or sometimes it's also called laser imaging detection and raging. Essentially, what it is, is that it is a method where we can determine uh, the range or the distance uh, between the source of output, which is a laser beam uh, shooting down towards the ground uh, to the surface of the site. Uh, and then what you do is when they shoot down the laser beam and they try to measure the time for the light to reflect back to the receiver that is on the helicopter. So using this technology, uh, of course the lasers are, uh, are beamed down in a, a very, very sort of like fast pace and therefore covering huge sort of areas uh, as, the tele as, the, as the helicopter flies past, uh, 
a particular area within a site. So what LIDAR does is that you are able to use this information to recreate 3D representations of areas of the Earth's surface and ocean bottom um, due to the differences and very slight differences in the laser return times uh, by, and by the varying sort of like laser wavelengths. And using this information, they are able to even capture the slightest kind of indentation that is on the ground that is very hard for archaeologists to perhaps even spot with our own eyes owing to the fact that Angkor and its surrounding now is covered by thick forested vegetation. So trying to hack through, you know, a jungle is not really not easy, but trying to detect even the slight indentation on the ground that might suggest that the land was cultivated or used before is an even bigger challenge. But LIDAR solved this problem because it has the ability to even sort of like map very uh, on very accurate terms uh, the, the, the way land has been sort of used uh, over time. Uh, so remarkably, this has allowed scholars to reconstruct a fuller picture to understand uh, what was the temple's relationship in, in uh, even to understand how long, uh, what, what kind of like uh, history did the temple undergo? So, for example, they have discovered the remains of the eight towers uh, near the western gate of Angkor, and the location of the tower can still be detected, surprisingly, uh, by lidar. And some of the towers appear to form a square pattern, and this suggests, uh, through close reading of the spatial arrangement of the towers and in consultation with other records, it might suggest that they have been used to support the shrine, especially during uh, Angkor Wat's construction. Uh, but besides understanding the religious economy of Angkor during the 12th century, Laida was also useful, for example, in allowing archaeologists to detect new structures, including remains of residences pools used by those who service Angkor Wat. Uh, they've also detected remains of the wider city of Angkor, and this city stretches outwards across huge expanse and distance. Uh, it is a huge city because it's also low-lying. Uh, it's uh, 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 outside of this monumental structure. The rest of the buildings, residential buildings, are often built in wood. And therefore, it stretches out in, across all different directions, uh, issuing from, from the center of the mandala, which is the Angkor Wat. Uh, so, interestingly, then you begin to also see uh, very interesting patterns that have emerged across uh, the Angkor city itself. For example, uh, what you see on the screen are these kinds of recti spiral design. Uh, uh, these can be detected beneath the vegetation and modern development, uh, which are highlighted in red. So these are the things that you see if you were to only look at the Google Earth. But LIDAR shows you a different layer all right, underneath this. Uh, this structure is made out of sand, and it is about uh, 1,500 meters and by 600 meters uh, in size. Therefore, it's huge, and the fact that it takes on a recti spiral design shape suggests that it is something that is cultivated. Uh, of course, the purpose is unknown. Uh, it could be used either for salt production or artificial wetland, or perhaps a floating field of garden, or even a mulberry garden to cultivate silkworms. All these are possibilities that uh, uh, we can surmise or guess based on uh, available historical records. But a map shows us this far. Nevertheless, it shows us a city brimming with economic activity. And so using this uh, type of uh, LiDAR technology and scanning huge expansive surface uh, around Angkor, what you get are, uh, you see, you begin to see sort of like uh, uh, patterns of neatly arranged mounds uh, that you see here on the first two image. Then in the third image, you also see those mounds uh, being surrounded 
by what looks like a water channel. So it's possibly a kind of moat. Uh, all these mounds suggest that uh, there was an attempt to plant uh, 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 something on that particular surface. And very often uh, scholars deduce that these represent actual houses that were built here. Why is that the case? Remember that in a Malay house, the principal construction technique is a posted lintel construction technique, and it lifts the house from the ground and therefore requires you to plant a uh, column beam onto the ground itself, and this leaves certain indentation. Similarly, the Khmer people also built houses in a similar way, and therefore uh, many of these mounds are records of where houses used to be located, and that's why it's also so, uh, so neatly arranged in a pattern form uh, on you know, a piece of land. Uh, so what begins to slowly emerge is also this idea that Angkor is not just an orthogenetic city. Uh, of course, there is that component that is very orthogenetic, and this can be seen in the centrality that, that the temple plays within Angkorian life. It sits at the center of the city, it radiates outward. It is the only lasting monument that has up with the time. Uh, interestingly, the king doesn't live in Angkor Wat, for example. He would live in a, like everyone else, in a, in a wooden house uh, that is perhaps either close to the temple itself or within the compound of the temple. Uh, so. Uh, even the, the king himself, uh, there is an aspect of him that is recognized as human and therefore partakes in human way of living. The temple, however, is a place or abode of the god and therefore requires a different kind of material that is meant to last longer. Uh, so there is one aspect of the city, the orthogenetic, as described by Mitzi. But there is also another aspect to the city that is heterogenetic and it is by seeing how important the canal system is and how the entire city in many ways is made up of a network of canals and how important pools of water is to the sustenance of the entire city that we also get a sense of uh, perhaps Angkor uh, uh, taking on a morphology that is more like Venice uh, rather than an inland city that is uh, arid or it's primarily land-based. And these would survive later on uh, as, a, as a built morphology uh, that uh, later empires would also adopt, such as Ayutthaya, right? The very empire that would sack Angkor and cause uh, the eventual, what is called the decline of the city, uh, although it didn't sort of it didn't mean that the city was entirely abandoned. It did cause some kind of decline, uh, and subsequently, Angkor would become, uh, sorry, Ayutthaya in, in Thailand would become the new empire and would draw a lot uh, from Angkorian concepts of political power uh, and, and use that, and, and even city planning, and use that in order to build up Ayutthaya as a new empire. Uh, so we'll stop here and then we'll continue on to look more specifically at art objects related to the Angkorian period.